Hello, I'm Matt Helmers with Iowa State University Extension and Outreach, professor in the Department of Agricultural and Biosystems Engineering and director of the Iowa Nutrient Research Center. Today we're at our Gilmore City Drainage Water Quality Research Facility. This site was established in 1988, set for drainage water quality monitoring in 1989. Then there was no flow in 89, uh, but flow started in 1990. And we've been monitoring at this site since that point in time, looking at the impact of different nitrogen management practices, cropping systems, uh, and their impacts on drainage water quality, specifically nitrate loss. So today we're gonna talk a little bit about how we monitor that drainage water quality and what some of our results are, specifically related to implementing winter cereal rye cover crop uh, on this site. Okay, this is one of our drainage water quality monitoring sumps. So at this site, we have 72 individually drained plots. Each of the plots is uh, 50 foot wide, 125 foot long, and down the center of each of those plots is a perforated tile line at about three to three and a half foot deep. Each of those lines comes into one of these sumps, and down in the bottom we have a, a garden variety sump like you might find in a lot of basements in Iowa. And then we have a sump pump in there, and we pump that water out of there, and then that water's pumped and it's pumped through a flow meter right here. And so with that, we can record how much water is coming out of each of in these individual plots. So we can quantify what's the drain flow associated with the treatment that we have there. One of the other important things that we wanna do is to collect a flow proportional water sample. So we want a little bit more water when there's more flow happening so that we can quantify kind of a, the flow weighted nitrate concentration and then ultimately calculate a nitrate load that might be exiting this, this system through the, through the drainage. And so right here you'll notice this tubing uh, in line in that PVC piping is a small orifice so that when, when that water is pumped, we get back pressure in that piping and that forces a small portion of all that water into a sample container. And then about once to twice a week, our research group will come out and take a representative sample of that, discard the rest, get ready for the next week. We'll take that sample back to the lab and analyze it for nutrients. What we're primarily looking at is nitrate. We've also looked at phosphorus at this site, but this is a passive way to collect a flow proportional water sample so that we can good, get a good representation of the concentration of, of nutrients, and in this case, nitrate, nitrogen, that's being exported out of that drainage system from the treatments that we have implemented on those plots. As I said, this site's been ongoing. We've been monitoring since 1990. We've looked at a variety of different nitrogen management practices, uh, cover cropping practices. So information from this site was used extensively in development of the Iowa Nutrient Reduction Strategy non-point source science assessment. So many of those in-field practices, whether they be uh, timing, of nitrogen application, rate of nitrogen application, or even cover crops. Research data from this site was used in that um, to quantify the impacts of those various practices. So not only to the Iowa Nutrient Reduction Strategy, other states have utilized information that's been collected at this site. We're out here in, uh, in a corn residue plot, October 12, 2020. And so one of the things that I think is interesting, about five years ago, We've been studying cover crops up here, winter cereal rye, for over 10 years. But one of the things that we did about five years ago is we switched from drilling the rye in after corn or soybean harvest to interseeding that um, rye about in the Labor Day time frame. And so one of the things, you know, in most years, this might be the time when we're drilling it, but this year we actually have some, some growth. Um, so I think that's one of the interesting things that we've seen, and we've probably seen a little bit more consistent cover crop growth um, since we've done that. One of the other interesting things this year, it's been really dry in Iowa and certainly this site has been no exception, uh, but we did get a little bit of rain right before uh, we seeded this cover crop. And as we're out here today, again, on October 12th, we got about a half inch of rain last night. And so we'll probably see this cover crop really start to take off here in the next couple weeks. Okay, I'm gonna ask, a graduate student in our Agricultural and Biosystems Engineering Department, Emily Waring, to come on in. And I'm gonna ask Emily a couple of questions. 
So Emily's been working at this site for a number of years. So um, Emily, you've kind of seen the shift from us drill drilling in the rye to uh, hand seeding it. Maybe you can describe you know, how we're seeding this and um, what, what seeding rate we have. So, yep, we hand seed it into a standing crop around Labor Day, like Matt said, and we do it at 90 pounds per acre. And then if you're wondering how much um, weight per area or um, above ground biomass we have, what I'm standing in, I think would be about 500 pounds per acre. We'll measure that in the spring, but based on what we've seen throughout the years, um, this is what I think that would look like in terms of cover crop height and density. Okay, as I talked about, we were talking about the, the sump and the drainage water monitoring. I mean, one of the things we're doing out here is trying to quantify the impacts of some of these management practices on nitrate loss. And so in particular here, we have this Wernier cereal rye cover crop. And so we're able to compare nitrate loss, nitrate concentration, where we have a Wernier cereal rye cover crop and where we don't. And we've seen, uh, even at this site where some years we don't get a lot of growth, we still have seen 20 to 40% nitrate reduction when we have that cover crop. And we'll talk a little bit more about that um, during the virtual field day. Um, but let me ask, uh, Emily has been doing some work looking at some of the soil health measures. And so maybe Emily, you can share a little bit on uh, soil aggregate stability and aggregate size that we've measured in the cover crops or non-cover crop plots. Yeah, so we measured um, soil aggregate stability, which tells you about soil structure. And we saw that with an addition of a cover crop after five years, we saw significant improvements to aggregate stability. So that means that your soil can stay together, which would improve things like infiltration and nutrient cycling. So we were happy to see that even at this high organi organic matter site, we saw um, significant improvements just after five years. Okay. Now I'm here with Carl Peterson, that's an ag specialist with the Department of Ag and Biosystems Engineering. And Carl is the one that makes things happen up at this, this research site. Uh, he does all the agronomic management, helps with all the troubleshooting and everything else we need to get done. But I ask, wanted to ask Carl a couple questions. Carl, maybe you can describe uh, how we manage this cover crop. We, Emily talked about how we seed it, but then at some point in time we have to terminate it. And maybe you can describe about you know, about when we terminate it compared to uh, cash crop planting and what you use to terminate it. Yeah, good question, Matt. So what we do up here, we try to get in and terminate this rye crop with a Roundup or a glyphosate formulation. And what we want to do is time it at least a week before we plant corn. And then we do the same thing for soybeans, but we're not so critical about when we get that termination done. We can Depending on the weather, we can get out and we can terminate it just before planting or maybe up to a week after planting for the soybean crop. But we do use the same glyphosate formulation for that as well. So one other question I had for you, Carl. Um, so while we, we don't get a tremendous amount of fall growth up at this site, have you, you know, have you seen any problems when you've combined beans close to the ground with any of the, any of the rye um, little green Green Excellent parts question. Of yeah, no. Uh, when I have had some good growth in the in the soybean crop, that's never a problem for harvesting soybeans. Typically, it'll just land on your cutter bar. It's not quite tall enough to cause any problems with any uh, sticking to the bean head at all. Uh, it literally just blows out the back of the combine, but it'll flow right through, and you'll never notice it at all. Even if we do have a good lush growth, it looks great. And I would say that's even with a a combine that isn't maybe the most modern technology. That's maybe right, we'll that's right. We got it. It is a little bit younger than me, but it is an old combine. Yeah. But yeah. yes, it's a 1977 technology, but it does great for test plots. And uh, if we put a modern combine out here, the combine would be literally as big as the test plots we have here. Okay, just to describe a little more about this site. Um, we're along Highway 3, as I said before, Gilmore City, Iowa, but it's kind of along the Highway 3 corridor in, in Iowa, in north central Iowa. And so, you know, this site, as I talked about, has really helped us look at various practices and their impacts on drainage water quality. I'm actually standing in one right now. Um, over 10 years ago, we implemented uh, a treatment, four plots here, uh, four replicates, where we're looking at a forage mix. So it's a uh, uh, orchard grass and then clover mix. And so we can look at 
the, the impact of that on nitrate loss, and we see dramatic reductions in nitrate loss when we, when we have this. So illustrating, you know, the more living roots we can get on the landscape, the greater reduction we can see in nitrate. Um, also within this general area, there are a number of wetland sites uh, where we're looking at um, our folks at Iowa State and, and uh, specifically put in by the Iowa Department of Agriculture and Land Stewardship under the CREP program, looking at denitrification wetlands for removing nitrate. So we talked about, you know, some of these practices can help us reduce that nitrate that gets in the tile line, but we still have some in that tile line. And so if we can route that through something like a wetland, we can reduce that downstream nitrate delivery. And so we've been working with, with some farmers uh, in the area here to document what land management practices are happening upstream of those wetlands as well. So it's been a very unique opportunity and really you know, highlights the importance of kind of working in the field as well as some of our edge of field practices if we want to make nitrate reduction gains.